Hello, I'm Anthony. Welcome back to the Steinberg Hallian 7 tutorial series. Today, we're going to take a look at the last piece of the primary user interface that we haven't discussed yet. Down in the lower left hand corner, we have this innocuous and blank looking section called trigger pads. I'm going to figure out how they work today. Hope you're enjoying the series so far. Check out the Patreon and channel member links below if you'd like to help support my channel and allow me to carry on making content such as this. An enormous thanks to everybody who's signed up so far. It really means a great deal. So without further ado, let's make a start. Trigger pads are basically eight programmable pads that allow us to pre-configure MIDI information in them to help us when we're writing our music. But let's start off nice and simply. I'm gonna right click on pad one. I'm gonna ask it to snapshot a chord that I'm playing. The pad starts flashing blue. Now it's waiting for me to play some notes. I can play them as a chord or as an arpeggio. It will carry on adding notes into the chord buffer until I click the pad again. So let's add the notes of the C minor chord. There's my C and then I'll play an E flat and that's turned blue and there is my G. So those are all of the notes that I needed. Now I click the pad and that's been remembered. Every time I press that pad now, it plays the chord. Now I want to rename that pad to remind me what's in it. Right click again, rename pad and type C minor. The next thing I want to do is to assign a trigger key to that pad so that I can basically activate these chords from my keyboard rather than having to click these pads. So if I right click once more, and this time I'm going to say learn trigger note, and I'm going to play C0 on my keyboard, which is not a note I would ordinarily play, so it's kind of free. And this time you can see that the, the notes turned light blue, so this means this is now a trigger key. Even though the instrument behind the scenes, I've got an electric piano dialed in here, is capable of playing any of the other notes on the keyboard, the C0 has now been reserved exclusively for the use of the trigger pads, and it won't send a MIDI note into the instrument to be played anymore. That behavior has been overridden. Now I'm going to assign the other chords of the C minor scale. I'll do one more on camera and then the rest of it, uh, the rest of it off. So snap, snapshot the chord, play D, F, and A flat. Click the pad, right click, rename. So this is gonna be a D diminished. Learn the trigger note, and this time I'll assign it to C sharp zero. Let's listen to those two chords. So I'll just play a C zero on my keyboard. And here's the D diminished. I'll populate the rest of the chords now, back in a moment. And there we are with all of the seven chords assigned. As you can see, I've assigned them to trigger notes, starting at C0 and ending up at F sharp zero. Fruity little B flat up here. Another way to do it is to drag those chords from Cubase. I have a chord track set up here with four chords all in the key of C minor. So if we play that little line. So if I decide that's gonna be my main chord pattern and those are the keys that I want to be assigned to the trigger pads, no problem, I can do that as well. I can pick up these chord pads from Cubase and drop them directly into Hallian. I'm gonna drop it into the eighth empty slot. I'm gonna drop the E flat major seven in here. And as you can see, it's been auto named. Now there's a couple of issues here. This trigger pad that you can see in the primary interface is always the first trigger pad that you find in any program. I'm gonna go on a little bit later to show you some of the issues that you can have with this, but you can actually have multiple trigger pads in a single program and we can assign them to different functions and, and switch between them. I'm gonna leave that aside for the moment because I want to discuss, discuss the core functionality before we go on to talk about something that's a little bit more complicated. But suffice to say for the moment, if I press this pad, it's now playing an E flat major seven. Now we've already got the C minor and the A flat configured on our seven kind of core pads. The G minor seven is missing. So what do I want to do? Do I want to overwrite? the existing G minor, or just leave this one alone. I'll overwrite it. 
I'm going to drop it onto the pad. Note that this pad is currently called G minor. And now it's just been renamed to G minor 7. And there's the G minor 7. Final thing to do is to assign my last trigger note. I don't have a trigger note set for the eighth pad yet. Let's do that. And it's going to be a G. Uh, I've taken focus away from Hallian. Hallian needs to have keyboard focus to get this. And there's the note going in. So here's the G minor seven being played when I press E zero. So the first seven notes are still chromatic. C, D, E flat, F, G, A flat, B flat. And then this eighth note is the variant, is the E flat variant. So I've either got the basic chord or the extended uh, E flat major seven. Now these trigger notes that I've just assigned to the eight trigger pads from C zero to, to G zero, can now be applied as a master template to every program in Hallian. If I right click on the pads, I have the option to save trigger notes as default. So however this configuration is currently set out, I can now apply that as a default into Hallian. I haven't yet told Hallian to use those pads for every preset. I'm going to load up a new preset now, and I'm gonna search for flex phrased, take away my keyboard filter, as I want flex phrased mini ARP. Here it is. If you ever want to know um, which expansion uh, a preset's come from, you can actually um, apply a filter to it in the results columns. It's in the media section and it's called library name. If I open that then off to the right hand side, there you can see that this has come from tree work. Nevertheless, let's load up the sound and we'll have a look at these trigger pads. So you can see that these trigger pads currently have no um, key switches assigned to them. I'm going to right click on the pad for a reason that I'll explain shortly and I'm going to say use default trigger notes and now there's my C0 to G0. I'm going to turn that back off again. There is a second way that you can do it. This little keyboard light um, is a shortcut to that functionality. Now there's an unfortunate user interface quirk here. You only get access to that button from inside this interface. If you're looking in the primary interface in the edit section, either sound or MIDI modules, you don't get that little keyboard icon. You have to right click to say use default trigger notes. As you're going to see shortly, it is actually important to have access to this MIDI modules section. So we're going to start drawing distinctions between these two things shortly. And the reason I've loaded up this particular preset is because this doesn't play chords. This has flex phrase variations. As you can see, each of the orange lights above the trigger pads um, is illuminated. This is telling you that there are flex phraser variations assigned to each of the pads. So let's have a look at the flex phraser. It's actually the one inside the mini ARP that's been programmed. Here it is. This sounds a little bit louder than the electric piano. I'll just turn it down a bit. So I'm gonna play a C major. Now I'm gonna start playing the key triggers. can see it switching the variations in the flex phraser. Now if you're experimenting with phrases like this and you, you want to do it on the fly, a nice thing to do is to switch trigger mode to next measure and then it'll basically do it in sections of bars so you can really get the, the, the kind of the feeling of how that arpe arpeggio is going to work. So I can press the key switches whenever I like. And it switches when it's ready to at the end of the bar. Can you hear that lag between it switching? If I turn off use default trigger notes, then it would be left to the program itself. It might assign its own key trigger notes. It might not. This overrides everything. Now it's possible to assign both a chord and a flex phrase of FET variation to the same pad. So the C0 pad, which is currently activating variation number one, I'm also going to snapshot a chord. I'll put that C major chord back in. There we are. And click the pad again. I'll do another chord on pad seven which is going to be variation seven. And this time I'll play an E minor. And remember that. 
So now when I switch between those two chords, I'm going to play a single note on the keyboard. I'm literally just playing C0 on the keyboard here. So it's playing the chord that I've programmed in as the snapshot chord and the variation that's been recorded as the snapshot variation. Now when I switch to F sharp 0, it plays the E minor chord with the variation number 7 off the flex phraser. But you might think that's a little bit too much heavy lifting for a single pad to do. You don't particularly want to tie that variation to that chord every single time. So let's make it forget those chords. So I'm going to right click on the pad and say clear chord so it remembers the variation but it no longer remembers those chords. What I'm going to do now is make a second trigger module. This is where we're going to have to abandon the primary interface trigger pad because it frankly doesn't work properly. I'm going to create a new uh, trigger module. It's inside the player folder, trigger pads. Here it is. And I'm going to rename this C minus one. And the primary trigger, I'm now going to explicitly rename to Z C zero. So C zero is our basic trigger pads that we've already configured. C minus one is currently empty. Now, when I clicked on it, the primary interface didn't update. This always shows you the first trigger pad in the program, which I think is poor. I think that has to go down as a bug. It's quite clear that the MIDI module is telling a different story and this is the correct story. So we've lost access to the little keyboard symbol. But basically, if you operate trigger pads from inside um, the edit section, then you're not going to go wrong. Before I go on to define these pads, one other brief thing to, uh, to mention is the orange lights are all illuminated. Flex Fraser variations um, only operate on a single instance of the trigger pad and they're basically all locked together. So if I make it forget the Flex Fraser variation on pad five, that light's gone out and the primary light's gone out on the main interface as well. These are different trigger pads that you're looking at here. So you only get one set of variations to play with, but you get multiple key triggers and chords, and that's what I'm going to set up now. First thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to make these, these uh, eight pads learn trigger notes for C minus one all the way up to G minus one. Then I'm going to put this C major chord that I was playing on the trigger pad earlier. I'm going to store it in the C minus one pad instead. So we're going to snapshot a chord. There's my C major, and that's now remembered. The other chord I played earlier was in E minor. For the sake of simplicity, to help you kind of visualize what these pads are, I'm going to assign this to the E minus one pad. Snapshot chord, there's my E minor, there's the pad stored. C major, E minor. And now I'm going to start playing the physical keyboard. I'm going to play a C minus one. You can see the C minus one been depressed on the virtual keyboard and the chord playing over the top. Now I'm going to use the C zero range to play variations of that chord. So there's the seventh variation kicking in. We have a look at the flex phraser. So if I'm playing in the zero range, I'm affecting variations. Interestingly, I just pressed variation number five then and was wondering why it didn't trigger. It's because I cleared it and I'd forgotten that I'd cleared the fifth key. So now I've got two different banks of trigger keys doing different jobs simultaneously. So I've configured multiple different trigger pad and blocks, blocks of eight pads to do different jobs. If I was going to do the proper full job, I would name these pads so that I was representing the chords that they were playing in the background. And now it's really obvious as I click on each of these things, what their respective jobs are. The information once again is not being updated in the primary interface. You kind of pretty much need to ignore this if you're using more than one trigger pad. If you have a fully configured set of trigger pads that you're very happy with, you can save them, save the preset, call it trigger example, save. Now when we go back into the library, here's our trigger example with the little user icon. And here are all of the default trigger pads that you can load up. And these are the codes that will now be played by those pads. So we have an 
F7 over 9, and so on and so on. Now I'm going to tell you about a bug in these trigger pads. This really confused me until I figured out what was going on. I'm going to copy trigger C minus 1 again and make a third trigger pad. This time I'm going to rename this C minus 2. I'm just going to work with the first pad here because this is all we need to demonstrate the problem. I'm going to assign that to C minus 2. So now I've got C0 correct, C minus 1 correct, C minus 2 correct. I'm going to reorder these trigger pads. Pick one up, move it somewhere else. C minus 1, uh oh. C0, trigger pad's completely disappeared. I don't know what trigger note is assigned to that pad anymore. C minus 2 is still correct. Let's move them around again, put that one there. What have we got this time? C0 is wrong. C minus 2 is now correct and C0 is missing. So if you have multiple trigger pads and you move them around, it seems that there's some sort of internal list that falls out of sync with the trigger pads themselves. And from this point onwards, pretty much everything's broken. They, they just, I can't really seem to make any sense of them. Furthermore, if you delete a trigger pad, so I'm going to delete C minus 2 here. Let's get rid of that one. And now if I add a third trigger pad in at the end, that's now been assigned to C0. As you can see, you know, there's clearly some internal listing thing that's going way out here. And now C0, which was previously working, has lost its assigned keys again. Don't mess with the order of these trigger pads if you're going to redefine them, because it seems from that point onwards, you know, that they're just fundamentally going to fail. But if you keep it very simple, and for the vast majority of situations, single trigger pad is going to do you absolutely fine. Just before we finish today, I'll show you one final example of a thing that's quite nice to do. I'm going to revert back to a working version of the program. So here we are back with our seven working chords in the key of C minor. They're all triads. Now I'm going to assign extended chords. So I'm going to basically add uh, the seventh to each of these chords, but I'm going to do it on C minus one. So this is where I'm going to redefine this to triad. Now I'm going to create a new trigger pad, which I'm going to call sevenths. Firstly, make it learn each of the trigger notes. And now I want to assign seventh chords. So snapshot my C, which is going to be C, E flat, G, B flat. And that's now remembered that extended chord. The very lovely D half diminished. Now I'll quickly run up the other chords, adding those uh, seventh chords into the pads. And it took me about five minutes to do that. And now I've got all of these beautiful extended chords to play with. So I've got the extended version and the standard triad version. That's a lot of songwriting flexibility at my hands. I've got two octaves worth of awesome chords to play with now. And all of those variations to go at. That's all for today's episode. Please hit like and drop a comment. Help me out with the YouTube stuff. I'll see you next time. Thanks very much.